Jackie Callen, thank you very much for coming on to theboxingbar.com. Thank you very much. Oh, gosh, it's my pleasure. Right now in this um, moment, there's a lot going on with all the coronavirus and all the extra things going on. How's it in that area over there in uh, Michigan? You know what? It's, it's pretty calm over here. I'm happy to say the price has been pretty good. We haven't had the looties and the arson. You know, we've had pretty peaceful, I would say, um, almost 100% peaceful protests. Um, Detroit's been through riots before in 67, and it really did terrible damage to our city. And I don't think anybody here wants to see that again. So I think we're all in solidarity with the cause, but nobody wants to go and step out of line and go that extra mile to add violence to the protest. Then it's no longer the First Amendment, is it? That's true. And I think, uh, you know, the, this uh, virus had a lot to do with that. I think the behavioral patterns of people, people are kind of uh, out on the edge a little bit. <laughs> And I think this, uh, I think that added a little bit to, to what's going on as well. I think it did too. I think people are sick and tired of being kept in. And, you know, we felt like a lot of our rights were taken away, right. especially in Michigan, because we were one of the most secured states. Our governor's, you know, very, very strict and gave us, you know, a lot of restrictions. So I know other states as well where people just wanted to get out. And this gave them a good excuse to get out. Now we just have to hope that in a couple of weeks we don't see spikes in the, the COVID-19 numbers because of all the lack of social distancing. Even though most people wore masks, they were touching each other and touching rocks and touching bottles. And I just don't know what's going to come in a couple of weeks. But we'll find out. Because if the virus is pretty much gone, we should have nothing to worry about. And if we have a big spike, then we know we did it to ourselves. That's true. And you can actually plug uh, boxing into this a little bit. Floyd Mayweather was willing to go ahead and take care of the funeral charges um, for the victim. You know, what do you think wasn't about that? that a, wasn't that a really terrific thing that he did? Yeah. I mean, I wish we all had the money to chip in and, and make that happen for that family. I saw today the... Um, baby mama and the little girl and it's just heartbreaking it is and i i know we all feel as bad about it as he does but he's in a great position financially where he can afford to pay for everything and it's a wonderful gesture and, and you know i feel like it's from all of us in the boxing world in a way absolutely and you know what it's not new to him when he fought uh Gennaro hernandez where he won his first title when he passed away suddenly actually floyd paid for his as well and um, I, I remember that he, he did a good thing there for uh, Gennaro as well. There's a side <laughs> to everybody that, you know, maybe kept hidden. And right. the fact that he spends a lot of money on cars and jewelry and flashes it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a kind giving side to his personality because he certainly does. Oh, absolutely. Also, my opinion on that is that, you know, it, poor Floyd shouldn't be covering this. I think it should be the people responsible for doing that to him. Uh, you know, just like we get fined or, or whatnot by police officers, you know, I, I think they should have been responsible to take this bill and uh, not somebody like, you know, nice enough uh, like Floyd. Floyd Listen, just... Not only are you right, mm -hmm. the other three haven't even been arrested yet. Right. So you look on TV, you see hundreds and hundreds of arrests every night, and yet they have not, as of yet, been arrested, which could have avoided all of this. All people want is justice. That's people right. want to see the people that did this accountable. And until they're arrested, I don't think we're going to have any unrest, you know, any, any peace. I mean, we're going to continue to see the civil unrest because we're not satisfied. We're not getting the justice that we want. That's true. And, and I think people are going to keep, keep on protesting until they're heard. That's true. And, uh, you know, when this happened back in the, uh, when, when Rodney King, uh, when that happened with him, all the riots didn't happen until after the court cases and all that. Imagine if these guys are found not guilty or something where, you know, they get a small, you know, slap in the wrist, then I think the real rights are going to start. And that's unfortunate because uh, if it's scary right now, I would hate to see what happens then. Yeah, but I don't think anybody in their right mind on any jury would want to be responsible for what would happen if that's they true. did not. You know, that's a big responsibility. 
you know, there's no way. Cause of death might be a little bit controversial right now as far as whether it was a heart attack or whether it was asphyxiation. The right. point is that these men caused his death in whatever manner it is. I don't care what manner it is. He was alive and then he wasn't. And it was all because of them. But that's, that's a very sore subject to me because I grew up in the era of civil rights. I went to an integrated high school. I, I grew up um, at a time when you were either very liberal or you were very prejudiced. It just was the 60s, and you either, you know, were for or against it. And, you know, because my family was very much involved in civil rights and rights for Native Americans, we were out protesting all the time. My parents were, you know, the type that really believed in in equality and justice. And so my brother and I were brought up in that culture. So we kind of take this personally. That's great to hear, Jackie. And uh, you're talking about growing up there. You're originally from the Detroit area, are you? Yes. I was born here. Mm -hmm. I lived in New York for a little while, and I lived uh, 16 years in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But back to my roots, back to Michigan, this is where my family is. I have children and grandchildren here, and, uh, and, and most of my really close childhood friends are here. So it's good to be back, you know, up until this uh, lockdown, I've been going back and forth to L.A. Hmm. pretty regularly. But, you know, now there hasn't been much flying back and forth. So it's been a while since I've been able to, to get back to L.A. Probably it's been about four months now. But we're, we're hoping everybody is that we're getting near the end of the pandemic. And hopefully life will get back to somewhat of a normal pace for us. You know, we'll be able to go back to our gyms and our health clubs and the beauty shops and the places that we're used to going. I At least I'm praying for that. Let's hope so. And during your time of growing up and your childhood, what was it like being raised there in uh, Detroit? Well, for me, it was terrific. Like I said, I was raised in a neighborhood um, where we had Jewish people, Christian people, black people, white people. Uh, it, it was a pretty mixed environment, and so there wasn't a whole lot of, of any kind of racism that I saw. Being Jewish, you know, I was aware of the Holocaust and the fact that, you know, there were people that didn't care for Jewish people, and I understood at a young age that there's just people that don't like you just because. Right. You know, if they don't have to know you to dislike you. They just dislike what you stand for, or they just like, you know, something about you that is is pretty ridiculous when you think about it, when you don't even know a person and you just right. like them because of the color of their skin or their religion. Right. So, you know, but my, like I said, luckily my upbringing was pretty free of all that, which is what made it so easy for me to go into a, a, a male dominated business. I was brought up that a woman could do whatever she wanted to do that, you know, sexism wasn't a, a, an issue. Do what you want, whether it's male, female, whatever the, the, the perception of that job is. Right. You can do the job, do it. And when you take a, a sport like boxing and an uh, area like, uh, you know, where you grew up there, I mean, it has some pretty deep roots there with Joe Lewis and Sugar Ray Robinson and, uh, you know, all the fighters from the Kronk Gym, you know, you could throw all of them in there, actually. I was going to tell you, it's interesting because my grandmother was one of Joe Lewis's teachers. You're kidding. And so I used to hear about him growing up because he had been in one of her classes. And so, you know, she was real proud of him and, and talked about him quite a bit. Wow. And, uh, and so that was part of the, the background of boxing that I had just growing up, just hearing about him. And then my mother was, was um, very friendly with Henry Hank and some who, who's, um grandson is Tony Harrison he's from here and mm. yeah fights. so you know we have all of us in Detroit go back to you know something connected to boxing because we've always been a pretty big boxing city back in you know even before Joe and uh, a lot of fights took place here with Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake LaMotta a lot mm. of great fights were here in Detroit so you know the Cron gym when I first started working with Emmanuel, only had two fighters. 
there was only Tommy Hearns and, and Mickey Goodwin. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't the famous Prague gym that it became. It wasn't really very well known outside of Detroit at all. Wow. And uh, when I got hired on as the publicist, part of my job was to help get the gym known outside of Detroit. And uh, we were able to accomplish that, I think, pretty well once Tommy became a champion. Hilmer Kenty was actually our first champion. And uh, so we grew pretty fast. And Milt McCrory and quite a few other fighters. Oh, yeah. Long it's an endless amount there of fighters that, you know, fought there, trained out of there. What, what was that atmosphere like, you know, be, to be in there like me that I never stepped a uh, foot in there? But how would you describe that atmosphere being in the Kronk Gym? Well, the first time I went down there, I was just really, really, um, I would say, caught off guard by how hot it was because that <laughs> gym, they kept that gym smoking hot. Yeah, that's, what the, that's the number one thing that everybody says, yes. Nobody had to worry about making weight. You were <laughs> in that gym every day. You made weight. It was <laughs> It was really, really hot. And the second thing that I noticed, you know, being from the suburbs, you know, I had never experienced cockroaches, things like that. And, you know, the gym was full of bugs. And so, you know, it was down a basement. It was very hot and humid. No one seemed to care or notice it. But, you know, I was a suburban girl and coming down there and and going home and finding my purse full of you know, bugs wasn't really the most um, interesting part of it for me. I never liked that. But I loved the the intensity of the guys, the way they trained, the way Emmanuel had them all really, really focused. You know, he would tell them what to do and everybody listened. And, you know, he really was more than just a trainer. He was a teacher. He was a father figure to these people. You know, these these. You know, guys, mostly guys. There were very few women that ever stepped foot in that gym. Mm-hmm. Later on, Christy Martin and, you know, some of the female fighters might have come in there to spar or, you know, if they were in town. Yeah. But in the days, you know, when I was there from 78 till, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, I was usually the only female within miles. And, uh, for me, it was an honor to be accepted in that fraternity. The boxers and the other trainers were very, very receptive, um, very respectful. They knew I knew my business, that I really paid attention. I learned how to wrap hands. I learned how to stop cuts. I really was a student of the sport, and uh, I think that was something that they respected. They knew I wasn't just hanging around just to hang around. And... Uh, I did my job. I set up the press conferences. I did the press kits for all the fighters. I worked on the weigh-in and the parties before and after the fight. And so I had plenty to do, and I enjoyed every second of it. There wasn't one fighter down at Crock that wasn't a, a complete pleasure to work with. Every one of them treated me like a big sister. It was really, really a great experience. That's awesome. And Emmanuel Stewart, obviously, like, you know, everybody knows how he became, you know, down the line, you know, one of the calmest, nicest guys. Was he like that uh, the whole time that you've known him? Was he always patient and, and, and polite and the whole thing? Or was he different, you yeah. know, back when you first met him? No, he was always like that. And when he gave me a chance, he explained to me, you know, you're getting into a male business. Right. There's be a lot of guys wondering, what are you doing here? What's your story? You know, there's going to be talk, there's going to be gossip, you know, people are going to question why you're here, you know, if you're involved with some of the fighters, what's going on, you got to have a thick skin if you're going to get in this business being a woman, and I said, that's okay, I can handle it, and uh, and I always felt like he and Tommy Hearns and the other fighters, I always felt like they had my back, and uh Emmanuel taught me everything. He was very patient, and I was a good student. I really listened, and I learned what he what he taught me. It was like going to college, and I feel like I graduated from Crock University. 
did you work somewhere previously before you know going into the crowd jam or or working there as a a, a publicist or well, I had my own PR firm. I was working with uh, athletes from the Detroit Tigers and Lions and Red Wings and Pistons. And oh. I, had all, I, I was a journalist and, and I'd been involved in public relations. So it was what I was doing anyways. But I just added boxing to, you know, what I was already doing. Right. And in order to really get in there and work it, I had to learn it. Because if you don't know what you're talking about in boxing, you know, they'll call you out in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I really had to, to study and learn. And uh, I didn't even attempt managing until I'd been around for 10 years. You know, a, a whole decade of, of working in the gym and, and watching him train and seeing how he selected the next fight for Tommy or the next fight for Milt McCrory. You know, how did he pick that opponent and what made him think that was the right opponent at the right time? So I just studied. And then when I felt I was ready, I asked him if he thought that I was ready to manage a fighter on my own. And uh, he said, I, I'm sure you are. You know, and he gave me his blessing. And uh, that's how I started. You know, just uh, a couple months ago, I was watching this documentary on uh, I don't know where, what station. But it was pretty much on women going into media in a male predominant uh, uh, environment like sports and in different sports. And there were some horrific stories, actually. And this was in the most of these were from people in the 80s, uh, mid to late 80s. So yeah, I, I couldn't even I couldn't even imagine you in the 70s in a sport like yeah. boxing. Or if you did you encounter a lot of, you know, stuff like that, you know, being in this sport? Well, I'll tell you, to be honest, I started as a sports writer in the mid-70s. I was one of the first females going into locker rooms back in the 70s. Wow. So I was pretty used to it by the time I got into boxing. Right. And I can I can really take care of myself pretty well. And uh, I don't take anybody's crap. So, <laughs> you know, if anybody ever started up with me, they got it back as good as they gave it out. <laughs> and then then we kind of laugh about it afterwards, but I can hold my own, but I'm yeah. very kind and I don't, I've never had a bad experience. I've never been sued by a fighter or sued a fighter. I've never been in arbitration. Mm. Um, I've never really had any negative experiences. I've never had any sexual harassment that was worth, you know, talking about because I can handle it myself. Mm. If somebody was out of line, I knew how to put them back into line in a nice way without making an enemy out of them. You know, boys will be boys. And, you know, I understand that. I have two sons. And hopefully they're more respectful than some of the people I ran into over the years. But, again, it's how you handle things. Mm. You can't just, you know, run and cry and act like it's the worst thing in the world. It's how you handle it. And fortunately for me, um, I've remained friends with everybody I've worked with. And I have no horror stories. So that's a good thing. Absolutely. And uh, you went, like you said, from, you know, doing uh, what you did at the Crunch to becoming a manager of a boxer. Was that a, a crazy transition for you? And not only that, you were the manager of a boxer that was known to be, you know, outside of, you know, outside of the box. It was James Tony, which, uh, you know, what people would call a madman in the ring and out, out of the ring. You know, was that a hard transition to do that? Well, you know, um, I kind of got into it in a, in a peculiar way. It wasn't intentional, but mm -hmm. um, George Foreman was on his comeback trail, and he came here to fight, and uh, he was fighting a kid from Chicago named Bobby Hitt. And he came in town, and I was helping to run the press conference, and he didn't have a manager. And I felt so bad. I went, oh, my gosh, you know, you don't have a manager? And I said, well... You know, if you need one, let me know. I mean, I had not managed a fighter, but I felt bad that this kid didn't have a manager. So he said, well, I, I don't have one, but I'd be interested in talking to you. So um, I ended up with him as my first fighter. And while I was in the gym with him is when I first saw James Tony. And then James joined us, and uh, I have was managing both of them. And uh, 
it was interesting because I, you know, being a woman, I see things a little differently. So I wanted my fighters to really look good in the gym. So I had Bobby Hicks wearing all these nice warm-up suits, and I'd be there in the gym with, you know, holding his legs when he gets sit up and wiping him down and being very, like, this very concerned mother, big sister kind of thing. And I think the other guys went, you know, God, I wish my manager did that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so it, it was almost like, well, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to have a woman manager. Right. So he kind of broke the ice for me. And he told James, you know, that I was a good manager and that I knew what I was doing. And, you know, and once James came on board, then Kenny Gould came on board, who had been an Olympian, and other fighters came to me after that. And that was before James was even a champion. But I think they liked the way I cared about them, because I really did care about my fighters. If I sign someone, their family. It's just, that's just how it is. Well, you had that connection with the fighters, like you said. You, you never really, you were able to handle yourself with the actual fighters and do all that. But now when you take a managerial role, and now you're going to have the media and, and the press, you know, saying things and coming after you. How did you handle all that? How did you deal with all those rumors and everything that was put in ink and in, you know, in, in interviews or whatnot? Well, well, how did you handle that? I really didn't pay much attention to any of it. Yeah. Um, it, it really, I know, you know, when you know yourself, you don't listen to what other people say. It didn't define me. It didn't even register. Um, you know, and, and after a while when I was, around long enough it kind of went away a little bit it's mm -hmm. like you know i mean now i'm still obviously working with fighters i'm 74 years old the rumors are certainly over with now <laughs> you know yeah. I, I don't think you know nobody suspects anything at all of a woman my age i mean i've got grandchildren that are you know older than some of these fighters so it's a different world than it was 30 40 years ago when i got into sports sure. but even then, you know, I think it was always just something that I knew came with the territory. I loved the sport. I loved what I was doing. And you just, it's like anything else. You take the bad with the good. Doing this manager role, who did you go to for advice or, you know, who was that, that key person that really helped you out when you think about it? Well, you know what? It's interesting because there really, there was no one to go to. There was no other woman that was managing a fighter that I could say, well, what did you do when they did this to you? Or what did you do when you called up and they said, well, if you want a spot on the card, you got to do this, this, or this. And it wasn't, you know, what they would have asked the man to do, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Or when, you know, you would call over and over again trying to get a spot and they'd give that same spot to one of the good old boys that they worked with all the time and not you and your fighter was way better than the other fighter that they were putting on the card. Uh, it, there were a lot of times that you just had to grin and bear it and prove yourself. And, you know, eventually, at the end of the day, you know, it all works out when you believe in yourself and you hang in there. And like you were saying, you know, whether you like it or not, it's you were a, a, a pioneer, you know, in, in what you did and as far as, you know, how you did it and that you were a woman in a, 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 a sport like boxing. Yeah, that's the point I'm making. Mm -hmm. I had no one to really ask, well, what did you do? Because there was no other woman ahead <laughs> right. of me to ask. Right. So, you know, obviously in the last 40 years, I've had a lot of women come to me, mm -hmm. and I can give them advice because I've been through it. So I'm glad that I kind of cleared that path to some of these other girls now who are out there in the business mm -hmm. because I can tell them a little bit of my advice how to handle certain things. And, of course, they're going to do it their own way. It's, you know, a different era than when I started. But it's still about being true to yourself. Um, you have to always remain who you are. You know, I, I had a lot of people say to me, well, if you're going to go to the gym with all these guys, you know, you should dress down, you know, put on sweats. You don't need to wear makeup. You should definitely not, you know, go in there looking all glamorous. And, and But that's... That's who I am. I like wearing makeup. I like wearing my jewelry. I like, you know, being dressed. And I wasn't going to change who I am. I just, that's just who I am. And so 
I would go to the gym in high heels and my long nails and and that's just who I am. And for those who accepted it, great. And if they didn't, that's okay. I didn't, you know, I don't uh, comment on you and how you dress for work. So, you know, I appreciate it if you give me that same courtesy. That's right. And because you did what you did and the way you did it, it actually made a character for, uh, or they based a character on you in, in that movie Against the Ropes, you know, and you were actually played by a celebrity like Meg Ryan. What do you think about that when you really, you know, sit back and say, wow, this, you know, that happened? You know, how, how do you remember well, that? Again, you know, had I been, you know, like an overweight, plain, you know, sweats and, and you know, gym shoes, sneakers, and, mm. you know, like one of the boys. I don't think the story would have been the same. Right. I think because I was a little bit more on the feminine side and didn't try to downplay that at all, uh, I didn't use it in any way um, to get ahead or anything, but I didn't downplay it either. I just stayed true to who I was, and I think that got me a lot of publicity because I was what they call the fish out of water. I didn't look like I belonged in the that I was in you know it was like an anomaly what is this woman doing in this sport you know mm. and so it really got me a lot of attention which in turn got a lot of publicity for my fighter because I got a lot of articles written and of course the first thing I did was talk about my fighter mm. so yeah it, it was a good combination at the time you know the fact that you know I was different and there was nobody else like me. So it, it, it enabled me to get kind of all the publicity. I didn't have to share it with any other women because there weren't any other. Like you said, all this worked. And uh, it even brought you on to do other things like the, like the reality show, The Contender, and stuff like that. What do you remember about doing that show, The Contender? I remember I was really that, into it. Oh, my God. That was so much fun. Was it? The first season, that first season on NBC, mm -hmm. I loved it because I – had the same dressing room with with Sly and, and Ray, and both of whom I knew very well going into the show. So we all had the same dressing room. We were together every single day. And the, the stories that were told, I, I mean, it was just amazing, the stories that were told in our dressing room between the three of us. And it was just a great camaraderie for about eight weeks, and I loved every minute of it. I still stay in touch with a lot of guys from the show, and uh, it's amazing how my birthday and Mother's Day, the cards I get from all my fighters and the guys I've worked with, it's so gratifying. I can't tell you how it touches me, how these guys stay in touch with me, all of them. Tom Boom Boom Johnson, Pinklin Thomas, Tyrus Salmasi, Bronco McCart, James Tony. All the fighters that I worked with, they still text me, call me, um, email me. We're all, we have a bond. We shared something together. And it's, it's to me a wonderful thing that we all have such great memories of that time period. And, uh, that I'm most proud of that, that I have no bad blood with anybody. I certainly, like I said, was never sued, never took advantage of anybody. And all you have is your reputation. And uh, the fact that I am still on such great terms with everybody is, is really what I'm most proud of. And you're right. All you know, all you guys became successful all together and, and as a group and as a team there. Um, there's a big surge in, in boxing right now with women. Uh, it's starting to come up again, you know, and uh, they're starting to be showcased on all these different big uh, promoter shows now, uh, unlike it was a couple years back. Also, there's a lot of uh, roles of like women play now in, in, in boxing. And again, like I, you know, stressed earlier that you were like a pioneer in, in all that. You know, what do you think about all the surge in, in women in, in, the, in the sport, not just in physically, but, you know, all around? I love it. You know, I, I, it makes me so happy to see because there was a time when it just wouldn't have happened. You know, I was sort of an exception to the rule. They got used to me. They, they trusted me. They liked me, but it was like they didn't really want any more. You know, they always let it be known that, 
you know, you're okay, but we don't need any more women in the business because it's not a woman's business. So when I see these girls now, it makes me so happy that that they're able to get into the business and, you know, do what they want to do, whether it's be a publicist, promoter, manager, whatever they want to do. I, I'm just so happy that I could kind of blaze that trail for them. I'm very, very happy about that. These uh, Hall of Fames and everything, and I, I know you've got awards and all these inductions and stuff like that. You know, what do you think of those accolades and, you know, when, when you do receive them from being recognized from everything you've accomplished and done in your life? Well, I think that's what anybody hopes for, you know. That's what actors strive for is that Oscar. That's what, you know, anybody in any business, you want to be recognized. And, you know, obviously the goal for me would be the, you know, International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota. And maybe when James Tony gets inducted, they'll do us both the same year, hopefully. Yeah. And that would be the greatest honor I can imagine. And, you know, if it's meant to be, it will be. And uh, I certainly would look forward to that. And especially to be inducted at the same time with James. Because um, we really did make history together. And it would be very fitting to go into the Hall of Fame together. So that's the dream I have, and we'll see if it ever happens. You guys would be my choice uh, when that would come or if it would come. And, uh, you know, I thank you very much for for coming on. But also, you're probably going to be around for many more years to come. How do you want to be remembered to, you know, what I call the three big Fs? You know, your fans, your friends, your family. How do you want to be remembered as an individual? I think I want to be remembered as being fair because that's extremely important to me. I want people to know I was fair. I want people to know I was respected. And I want people to know that um, I care deeply about all the fighters I've worked with. And that's the most important thing to me. Um, It's not about money. It's not about any of those things. It's about changing lives. And I, I like to think that I've changed some lives along the way. When I first saw you uh, when I was a kid in, in the boxing game, I think you were the only woman I remember seeing on TV. So, you know, that's what I think about every time I think of you. And, you know, just what you did in the sport and reading everything that you've done. And, you know, you're a motiv- motivational speaker now. And, you know, just, you know, your accomplishments and what, you know, you've done for the sport. And, uh, you know, I, I just think of that all the time, you know, when I hear your name and, you know, I'm proud of you thank and everything you so you've done. Much for that. And, and, that's and thank you very, very much cool. for giving me the time to come on the boxing bar to tell us exactly what you thought and about your career. And I appreciate it very much. Thank you. And anytime you want to talk, you know how to find me. Great interview. Thanks so much.